Plain chant is also sometimes called Gregorian chant, named after Pope Gregory the Great. But this is based on a myth, a very useful myth first propagated by the Carolingian kings. You know, Charlemagne, or as I was taught to say, Charlemagne, Carolus Magnus. He was king of the Franks from 768 until 814 in the Common Era. Dr. Fassler tells us that he was the first great patron of music in the Latin Middle Ages. Like all rulers, he wanted to establish order in his realm, and the church, of course, was central. He established rites and practices that he considered authentic. They also supplanted the earlier Gallic practices with those coming from Rome, thereby putting his imprint on the liturgy and, very importantly, setting up a new political idea, the establishment of a Holy Roman Empire, with him, of course, at the top. But it wasn't enough to simply use existing Roman chant. It needed to come directly from God. So the Carolingians resurrected a myth in which Pope Gregory the Great is dictating sermons to a scribe from behind a screen. The scribe notices that there are inexplicable pauses. The scribe peeks through the screen and observed that the Pope was listening to a dove, the symbol for the Holy Spirit, and then dictating what he heard to the scribe. In subsequent portraits, this is shifted from sermons to plain chant. It's an enormous repertory of monophonic, that is, single voice music, that was also set some of it set polyphonically uh, in the ninth century itself, and we have evidence of that. We can transcribe it even. And it's a repertory that uh, was written for two enormous cycles. One for the mass, and that's the, the service of, of communion in the Catholic Church. And the other is for the office, which are hours of prayer. So in a monastery or cathedral, you would say those hours of prayer every single day, and they were all, I said you would say, but you would sing. So that's why there's so much music, because the average person in a, a cathedral musician or a, a monk or a nun would sing five or six hours every day and would sing on major feasts eight or nine hours uh, during the day. So you know, it, it's called uh, the Opus Dei, the, the work of God, and it's a work. If you spend much time in a monastery where a chant is sung, you'll find that the people are incredibly busy. They're too busy to talk to you. They're too busy to Zoom with you, if they did Zoom, because the office and the mass take up so much of their time. Their work is prayer and it's sung prayer. Earlier, I mentioned neumes. These are the little symbols you see on a four-line staff that notate sound and pitch, sometimes some little squares or squiggles. Think about this for a minute. How does one notate sound? It's not as simple as you might think. This word neum is taken from the Greek pneuma, which means sign or gesture. Gesture! I love that. To me, all music is gesture, a physical movement embodied in sound. And this is key to understanding the performance of chant. It must have a stress and flow, which if you learn how to read this notation, greatly enhances your appreciation of the music and how it plays with the text. Mind you, this is not yet rhythm. We will learn about that in a later episode but it provides stress and groupings of notes. And it was a great achievement bequeathed to humanity by the Carolingians. Let's move to two other types of chant, each with their own function in the liturgy of the mass. But first, let's quickly establish 
that the Mass is the church service that celebrates and recreates Jesus' Last Supper with his apostles before the night he was crucified. Jesus commanded them to do this in remembrance of me. Certain elements were added, such as the recitation of the faith and more. First, there's the Mass Ordinary. These are the texts that will be spoken or sung at every Mass, regardless of time or season. They include the Kyrie, Gloria, Credo, Sanctus with Benedictus, and the Agnus Dei. Then there are the propers, those texts that are added to the ordinary and change every single day in a cyclical manner that reflects the changing seasons and the reading through of the Christian Bible over long periods of time. One of the propers of the Mass is the introit, which happens at the beginning of the Mass. The one we're about to hear is a famous one for Easter Sunday, the celebration of Jesus' resurrection. So it is aptly titled Resurrexi, or as we're pronouncing it in medieval French Latin pronunciation circa 1200, Resurrexi. Eric Miranda, longtime member of Bella Voce, would like to share his insights of singing different historical versions of languages, particularly Latin. So one of the peculiarities about doing a medieval program is language, for sure. You know, the further back we go, um, the, the more holes there are. But one thing that we know, uh, and that still happens, is that people spoke Latin in the accent of the vernacular. Uh, so, and um, the, at the time, for example, there wasn't uh, a nation of France, so people spoke differently in the North uh, uh, than in the South. I, who am a French minor, discovered that there are some things that are actually closer to the Latin in the medieval French Latin than they are to modern French. Um, and one of those things is uh, use of je instead of je, like for example, Jésus, instead of, uh, which would be the modern, more modern pronunciation, and Jésus would be the more medieval pronunciation. Another difference is uh, resurezi, the X, which in modern Latin from pretty much everywhere uh, would be pronounced X, uh, a K-S. At that time was resurezit. Resurezi is an antiphonal chant. You'll hear first a single singer intone the portion of the chant called the antiphon, then the rest join him. Then the same single singer sings a psalm verse, then the rest join in again singing the antiphon, then the doxology, then the antiphon again. Antiphonal. Here we go. <laughs>
Next, let's turn to a gradual, which means it is to be sung on the gradus, the steps leading up to the altar, and was sung after the first reading from the Bible. Viderunt omnes is a gradual for the Christmas season and is a responsorial. In this, you'll hear everyone begin together singing the portion of the chant called the respond, then a soloist sings the verse, then all sing just a portion of the respond called the repetendum. Let's listen. Yeah. 
To be alive in the Middle Ages meant that you were tied unequivocally to the cyclical nature of the seasons. The rotation of biblical texts mirrored this change, but so did each day and night. If you were a cleric, monk, or nun, you participated in a musical ritual each day wherein you would sing up to four hours. These services were called the office, the most familiar nowadays being matins and vespers. These services were different from the mass in a number of ways, but principally there was no Eucharist or communion. So the medieval mind uh, that knew this chant, medieval minds that knew it, men and women and children, they're, they're filled with tunes and tune types and text music relationships and feasts and seasons and all of the music that they know is, uh, is situated in a particular moment of time. Um, I made a film about the nuns of Regina Laudes who still sing Gregorian chant. Um, and that's a, that's a uh, Benedictine monastery in Bethlehem, Connecticut. And I was working out with them one day in the field. And one of the nuns began to sing an antiphon and she sang it and then she said, oh, I've been waiting all year for this antiphon. And I said to myself, that's the medieval musical mind. It's a mind that's tuned to seasons, to days, to years, to repertories. And every single day is like your birthday in a sense. Because you have a whole repertory of tunes, you wake up in the morning and you're gonna start hearing them and then you're gonna sing them because you have them in your mind. So I would say that's probably the biggest difference between uh, us today and medieval musicians and performers of music. music. Our, our brains are basically empty. Um, we look things up. You say to someone, do you, know, do you know the answer to this? And you say, no, I don't know the answer, but I know where to find it. Um, a medieval person would never say that. You know, a medieval person would say, would either know it or not, because what a person knows would be in that person's memory. Let us now turn our attention to an altogether different kind of chant. This one is a great responsory for the Office of Matins and sung for the Virgin Mary. Unlike the other chant we've heard, which was composed by the most prolific composer of all time, Anonymous, Sirps Jesse was composed by Bishop Fulbert of Chartres, or at least it's attributed to him. Dr. Fassler tells us that he was a highly regarded teacher whose students took on important musical leadership roles in choirs all over Europe. Because of this, and because of the opulent beauty of this chant, 
Chartres was known for centuries as a famous center for music. This melody is so beautiful and striking because it is free from some of the more formulaic aspects of other chant. Remember, monastic communities had to memorize this music, so formula had an important role. But this is not only free from that, it also has a long melisma, that is, several notes grouped together for one syllable of text, on the words, flos filius eius, which translates as the flower, her son. And this same music is sung to spiritui sancto, to the Holy Spirit, thereby symbolizing that the Holy Spirit rests in the sun. Let's listen to Sirps Jesse and make note of the more fluid, perhaps less inevitable sounding outpouring of melody. Hildegard of Bingen was a prolific composer, writer, visionary, abbess, and confidant of the politically powerful. She's really one of the first major named composers that we know for certain wrote this music. I get asked all the time, what is so important about Hildegard of Bingen? And my response would be, what is not important about Hildegard of Bingen. She was the most amazing medieval woman I can think of full stop. Uh, she, from a very young age, had visions and she was brilliant. And she did a thing that set her on the path to becoming uh, one of a number of firsts or onlys in medieval society. She had visions. She believed they were from God. Uh, she was raised in a convent. And when she was old enough, she wrote many, many letters to religious officials asking them to confirm whether or not her visions were indeed from God. And in these letters, she expressed concern that the devil was in fact trying to trick her. And so, she wrote numerous times expressing this anxiety and word came down from top church officials that indeed her visions were legitimate visions from God and she should obey them and she should follow what they tell her to do and she should use them as guidance. And so Hildegard promptly set about correcting church officials for their bad behavior because in her visions, she had been told to do so. And these same church officials who had legitimized her visions couldn't then turn around and say, oh no, whoops. Uh, they had to agree that in fact, when she was correcting them, she was right. Uh, she was one of the first, I believe only woman, to preach openly in the Middle Ages. She went on a preaching tour and she preached both to the clergy and to the laity. She wrote music. Uh, beautiful, beautiful music. In fact, when my husband and I were married, uh, one of her pieces from the Lauds of St. Ursula uh, was performed at our wedding. Uh, the music that Hildegard produced for her nuns to sing was truly stunning and it's become more and more popular uh, in the 20th and 21st centuries. She was a true polymath 
an artist, a brilliant writer, um, and everything she did was inspired by a very sincere devotion to God. Hildegard was very well versed in compositional procedures and genres prevalent at the time, which is now the last half of the 11th century. But her chant, particularly Matthias Zanctus, which we are about to hear, is complex and ornate. It begins simply enough, but Hildegard begins to add layers of notes or repeated notes at a different pitch level. It's also hugely long with many extended melismas and the range, that is the lowest note to the highest, is expansive, well beyond what would have been considered standard practice. So it has a virtuosity to it. This was written for the monks in Trier, whose patron saint was Matthias, the last apostle, the replacement for Judas. It's an indication of how important localized saints were to every community in Europe. Let's listen to this tour de force. So far we have explored music's evolution and its relation to time in the Middle Ages and what beauty there can be with a single line of music, monophonic chant. Next time we will explore what happens when we add a new voice to the melody and the aesthetics of a more complex music that emerges in the school of Notre Dame in the 12th century. And we will learn how an important music advance was made, the ability to notate rhythm. Join us next time.